going to talk about lessons from uh, serial entrepreneurship. We have someone who's incredibly qualified for this, Kevin Ryan. He's the founder and chairman of MongoDB. He's also the founder and chairman of Zola Workframe Nomad Health. Previously founded, he was chairman of Business Insider and Guilt. And uh, he spent a big part of his career uh, leading double click. Uh, through its growth from about 20 people to about 1,200 people. So, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, happy to be here. So you've been involved with a lot of companies, and I want to start by talking about your involvement. You're not a, you're not a typical uh, founder or a typical investor in a way. You kind of defy the categories. How do you describe what you do? Yeah, so for the first 15 years, I was really a CEO, CEO of Doubledeck, and CEO of Guild for many years. And now what I've been doing is a different model, which is I come up with an idea, I, uh, I do put some money in at the beginning. Uh, the difference is that I, very soon I will bring on a co-founder who will be the CEO, and I'll be the chairman, which allows me to have multiple companies. Uh, the CEO runs the company, and I, my role, I'm, I'm very old, and I've done this uh, for a long time, is to you know, help that person be successful and build the company. And some things I've done a lot, I've raised probably 40 rounds of financing, and so, our CEO wouldn't have done that yet, and so hopefully I can help them do a better job hiring people, strategy questions. So I'm in between what a board member would normally do and a CEO. And this allows you to be involved with a number of companies simultaneously. Yeah. So in, in a given period of time, you might actually go through the same process with a number of yeah. companies. Now, I don't, per year, I don't think that many, but some, you know, one was 11 years old, so, you know, we started it uh, quite a while ago and are still very involved. Um, so every year, I generally will start one company and I might make one or two significant angel investments. So that's what I've been doing recently. And so I have about 14 companies that I'm involved with. And I really do it only in New York City. I have one or two exceptions, but I want, the reason I want to do it in New York City is because I am operationally involved. And so if it's 3,000 miles away, I'm not going to know the senior team. I'm not going to know what's happening. I'm not going to have the network of people that they want to hire. So I want to be able to bring that to the table. And I can do that in New York, and I can't do it elsewhere. So you, you talked about how there are three central ingredients to starting a company. And so one is uh, the idea, and the second one is the people, people. and the third one is the finance. Is the money, yeah. Those are, I will say, are the building blocks of a company. Those are like the, the raw materials. And so actually, you never need to worry about the money. There's so much money available that if you have a pretty good idea and good people, then you will get financing. Uh, they're in a terrible market, it might be harder, but the last eight years, you know, so many things get financed. So I really just focus on the first two. Yeah, so let's talk about, maybe we talk about the three of them in turn. So let's talk about ideas like how do you, you come up with the ideas for a number of companies? What is your process for identifying those ideas? Yeah, so my, my process in a way happens every single day. So I'm just always thinking about problems out there. What, where's your pain point? Something in your life must be too expensive, hard to get, you know, just inaccessible. And the, the solution is a company. Almost every company is fulfilling some need there. And so it can be in your personal life, at the consumer level. That guilt was that. I mean, there were people here who wish they were in a sample sale, but they're actually at a conference, and so they missed it. So if I brought the sample sale to you, it was actually solving a problem that you didn't quite realize that you had, and then hundreds of thousands of companies wanted to do that. I mean, you know, sometimes it's a key to be problem. So if I were talking to you about your industry, you said, oh, I'm in the chemical industry, I just start saying, so what are the big challenges? What are the solutions? And you might say, yeah, we can't get the data here, or we can't find the right company to do this. And I'd say, wow, maybe we can have a solution for that. And I do this all the time. I come up with maybe one idea a year, maybe two. So it's not that easy, but um, there, are, there are opportunities everywhere. What, was there a similar process for MongoDB? Yeah. So Mongo, the three of us were sitting there just talking about the problems of scaling a company. So this was 2007. You know, your content was delivered just fine, and Active Eye and other companies had solved that. Every scaling problem really was a problem with database. And data, as you can see, was getting more and more complicated. We all know it's the quantity of every measure is growing dramatically. Video is starting to grow dramatically. It's going to continue to grow for 50 years. And so that causes, you know, challenges. So the other thing we saw whenever we launched a company was, well, if this was 2007, and I said to the CTOs of the group, What's the most 
expensive piece of software that you bought, and you almost always say, oh yeah, that's my Oracle database. Man, is that expensive. Whereas a lot of other things are open source, prices come down, uh, and those are being solved, and that one has not been solved. And so we thought, we can do better, and we can do uh, it what, How do you get confidence that you're, the problem you want to solve is big enough? So the sort of parody of startups is, uh, I need shoelaces, so I'm going to start it on the end, shoot it in shoelace delivery startup. And, and that seems to be a common error that people identify kind of niche problems or how do you, what would... Yeah, I think a lot of people do start companies that I would really call either products or sometimes they're really just big features that they put into that problem. So, yeah, I, I think about that, so you don't always get it right, but things I've done after, you know, business insider, business publishing, you know, discount merchandise, uh, databases, even uh, dumb animals, temporary doctors and nurses. So that's, you know, think that's a $20 billion industry. So I just have to believe that I'm going to get, you know, 5% of that and I'm going to have a pretty good business. So I do want to go after, and I try and only go after markets that I think are big enough, though it's not going to be interesting for me. I've got to feel like if this goes well, this is going to be a million dollar company. And sometimes you get right, sometimes you don't. But if the big market, you have a much better chance. And, you know, we see the disproportionate one of one bigger ideas. So they'll actually pass on good, small ideas because it really won't make it fun. And they'll, they'd rather have something that's a lower probability but big return. Billion dollars in valuation. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk, so we talked about ideas now for a minute. Let's talk about people. How do you identify, find, attract uh, talent? So, you know, and then for a while, I, I meet a lot of people, I stay in touch with a lot of people, I uh, encourage that, you know, I host every year the double click reunion, um, or the built reunion, and I also sometimes start off with a double click reunion, which continued for years when we were a decade. Um, uh, many of my companies actually are with people I've worked with before, so the entire management team in Zola worked for me at Gilt, uh, the entire management team at uh, Co-Edition, which is coming launched four months ago, was uh, worked for me at Gilt. Uh, Security Scorecard here in New York, which is a company worth under $200 million, is started by two people who worked for me at Gilt. Um, uh, a new company I've just been doing, it has been announced uh, two months ago, is someone who worked at Gilt. So it's not only that, but I keep in touch and people come to me, and then sometimes I need to go find someone. Like in the Business Insider, I didn't have any media person to do it. I just went out and interviewed 10 people, just like any search, and found Henry Blodgett and thought he was amazing. And uh, he was a great fit. He's still there today, 11 years later. And there, there are two other dimensions of what is your, what do you look for in someone you are in their names always? And then another dimension is finding people and actually convincing them to join yeah. one of the many companies you're working on when it is possibly as no other employees or funding. Yeah. So um, in terms of visiting the join, that is, uh, you know, that's the job of a CEO, founder, or chairman. Is your job is to convince people to take pay cuts and not work for you because they believe this is going to be successful. And so I have to be good at that. And it doesn't always work. Some people just say, no, I don't believe it. But if they like the idea, and hopefully they feel like I add value, and they say, you know, you've had a lot of companies that have really worked, uh, that's successful, maybe, and you're putting in money as well. So this will help me, you know, we'll be able to raise money, VCs know you, so they've got to feel like I'm bringing some value to the table, otherwise they just do things on their own. Um, so I think that's, that's very important. Just what I'm looking for, I start by thinking, the, what is the core kind of business that I'm starting? What is that core skill? There's only one thing we get right. Ideally, the CEO has that background. Because every CEO comes up with one of the tracks of sales, marketing, product, something. Um, so like this insider, Henry was an incredible writer and had a real sense for that. Uh, at Zola, it was like two co-founders, the CEO is a product person. So product is the number one thing. At Mongo, my two co-founders are unbelievably brilliant technical engineers because that is the most important thing there. So they start generally with that. But then you have the intangible skills of, you know, the sort of product market fit is the single most important thing you need in that first 12 months. Then you start scaling and they need to be able to attract people. Because at the end of the day, you know, the CEO gets all the credit, but they do very little in the scheme of like, obviously there's, you know, we have a thousand employees at Mongo, so the today the CEO will put in one one thousand of the labor. So what
what is the real job is he, he has, she has incredible people doing great work. That is the value. And so I think of it that CEO is more like a coach of a football team. So, you know, I, I didn't play football, but obviously a good football team has very specific positions. You need that quarterback is different than a punter, which is different than a, a, a running back. And so anyone who can get great players, the team's going to win. It's more about that than the training techniques or something like that. Let's talk about the third building block, which is financing, just for a minute. You said if you have the first two, the third comes in. But over the course of building all these startups, do you have any um, sort of principles about the sort of funding you'll take, or what, what is the, what's the recipe for funding a company that not only secures funding, but is sustainably, sort of healthily funded into whatever the outcome is? Yeah, I certainly have a big bias for going towards VC and not strategic. Strategic players tend to come in and out. Who knows what they're going to be excited, you know, two years from now, they'll cut back. Uh, they have conflicts where VCs are no alive. So I, I've had, I've worked with probably 15 different VCs, and I have either great relationships with people who are about them. Uh, so I want that. Um, it's more the process that is important. And most people I see don't do the right process. And actually, I did a whole piece that was published on First Round Capital about what I think the right process is for raising money. Uh, but a lot of it is just that structure, make sure you have a deadline, make sure you go out and see all the players at once, uh, make sure you go out and, if you want to raise 10 million, go out and say you're raising 6 to 8 million. So everyone's like, oh my god, it's going to be great, I wish it's going to be lower than I thought. Then I have five people who are all interested. Then it becomes an auction. Then, in a way that doesn't seem bad, but once people are engaged and invested, you think about how you'd sell a painting. I bought it 3,000. Even though you say you're going to stop at 5,000, you get in with it. You don't want to stop. You want to win. And that happens on PC firms as well. I actually need to have you at the table and then persuade you. But they also have to believe in the CEO. They have to believe in the business. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, but we're in a great time. There's a lot of money. It's all good. And what's your view of public markets for, as an outcome for startups? Yeah, I mean, it's harder. I took public in public 24 months after we started. You can't even do that anymore. Uh, but it was super fun. Uh, I recommend it highly. The bubble was a great time for those of you who were there. Uh, but now uh, we took uh, on the public in October, and Seoul is probably you know two three years away from being able to go public. So it's only an option when you have you know a hundred, two hundred million dollars in revenue, and you feel very good about your ability to predict your revenues and earnings. So for some companies, it's easier than others. Uh, but I think it's a good alternative if uh, you, know, you you look you need to get liquidity for people at some point. And in companies like Mongo, that I think will be, you know, Mongo's doing whatever, 200, 225 million in revenue this year, and I think we'll go to a billion or two billion, but it'll take another five, seven years. You know, you can't, it's hard to stay in private for another seven years. And so it's an easy way to get capital, and you know, it allows people who want to get out to get out. And so it's a way to build a very big sustainable great business. We've been very happy with the process. It's not great. I would probably get $24 a share at $75 a share today. Let's talk about boards for a minute. And you're, you're really well qualified as a chairman of a bunch of boards, but also a, a founder who's that so you have a bunch of different boards. What makes a good board, and maybe kind of relatedly, people who might think about becoming a first-time board yeah. director, how, how should they think about what their job is and what, what they should do? So I, I, I think for all executives uh, who are running internet companies or senior executives, if you can get on another board, perspective, being on the other side, uh, you don't want to be on 20 boards, but being on one board, uh, I find very, very helpful as part of your development. Uh, and look, the right person is someone who understands that the team is running the business. You are not there to start micromanaging some small deal. Uh, you are there to help them give them advice at value and stay out of the way if they're doing their job. But they, you know, at a certain point, the board needs to replace the CEO, and that's not a big decision, but a very important one. So you've got to be in a position where you have the judgment to do that, or contribute to that conversation. Um, so that's very important. But I see, you know, in general, VCs are pretty good. Remember, some just get too involved, and I need to, you know, talk to them and scale them back. Like, look, you know, when we ran DoubleDeck, we told the board, look, we need to be clear, we run the company. And so the board does not need to get involved in furniture in our office or other things, regardless of your opinion. You need to be involved on very, very big decisions, and which include reporting.
rewarding, you know, rewarding us. So we always say, look, we're never going to have employment contracts. You can fire us at any time. That's your, that's your recourse. We want your advice, and if you feel really bad, you should find someone else to do it. But in the meantime, we need to run the company. We can't get in the way, and we can't have employees feel like you guys run the company and not us. What are, what are the most common mistakes you see founders making, startups making? You know, it's hard to uh, there's a couple different buckets there. So, one, it's hard for, obviously, you know, all of us are trying to hire the 20 best people in New York City. Guess what? There are not enough people to go around. You know, it's like the Knicks, if they could get LeBron James, they would have LeBron James. They can't get him. And so the team's not good. So, you know, that is a challenge for all of us. You know, I think the best ideas plus CEOs are going to get those good people. So there are many, many companies that just don't have great people. If you were all CEOs right now, and I said, you all have a CTO, and I said, so out of the CTOs who work for all the people in this room, raise your hand if you're pretty convinced your CTO is in the bottom half of all CTOs. And of course, no one raises their hand, which defies simple math. They just don't know that 50% of the people in this room have a subpar CTO. And another 50% have a subpar uh, CFO. And you don't know it. And so, the ones who do and have gone in there are the ones who are going to have a better team. Uh, and so, not giving the people is one thing. Um, and not only like replacing them quickly, yeah. when you realize it. That's very difficult. And those are judgment calls. You never know. Uh, it's disruptive. If you can get a better person, that's hard. So, that's a good challenge. Um, and the decision, some people you know, are spending too much money, some people are not spending enough money. I mean, you need to get, you just raise your $4 million. By the time you raise money again, you've got to have proof points done that make people feel like the company's more valuable. If you hold your, if you said I'm going to spend my money for two and a half years, someone else is going to spend it faster, you're going to get more done, and you're going to be left behind. And so I see that happening as well. You know, and they always ask me, wait, what if we spend all our money in 15 months and we can't raise money? And I say, well, you'll go bankrupt. And I, yeah, I didn't like that answer. But that is the answer, and you have no choice. Because you live in a world that other people are moving very, very quickly. You've got to get used to making decisions earlier than you would like to. If you want to wait until it's obvious, it's too late. Because someone else did it first. Um, just a, from a personal like, management, productivity standpoint, how have you found over the years effectively be involved in so many uh, different operations efficiently in a focused way to your best ability. Yeah, so the thing that it's important to understand for any board member, including me, is you know, what do you get involved in what you're not. So I don't pretend to be the expert on which new feature we should be building for MongoDB. And uh, I don't pick items for the Zola Wedding Registry. So I can add value in certain areas. Senior executives performance, how do we feel about that? Do we have good quality people? Are we making good, big decisions? And are we using our capital efficiently? Um, and so I just want to focus on those. And so there, all of those have nothing, very little to do with the real details of the business. And so I can know enough to, to do that. Do you have a sort of personal productivity habits or hacks that have enabled you to be? You know, nothing too complicated. I want you know, we have reports, so most of them, depending on the level of the company, they have a report they send every two weeks for every month. That's going to be like five or ten pages, that's just so we know what's going on. Yeah. And then I'm going to be spending time. I need every CEO every three weeks, generally. So we'll spend an hour to the detail, and then things will come up as we go. Um, but you know, all I would say is there's everyone else. You never know if you're being as productive as you should be, um, or you're spending too much time on small things. That happens to all of us. I struggle with that as well. Um, before we're going to wrap up in just a minute, you, you, you have a view across technology and media from your various businesses. Um, if an entrepreneur came to you and said, where do you see real opportunities in those sectors? Is there anything that stands out to you today? Yeah, so Jim, well, first of all, I am really bottoms up, not top down. So I think there are opportunities in every sector. But um, you have to begin the details of saying, these are an opportunity for this right now, and there are small pockets that are still available. In general, the areas that have not been completely dominated by startups so far are financial services, still opportunities there. Those of you are still doing business with banks that are 100 years old and have high cost structures, and that will change over time. Education, you're still doing most of your education with institutions that are 100 years old and have not been disrupted yet, so that will that will take time and that will happen over time. 
I find in general the consumer space more crowded than B2B space. There may be more people here are thinking about can I order a suit online or a bottle of wine or a pair of shoes or a date or a hotel room. Most of those have been sold pretty well. Whereas in the you know, finding a temporary doctor for a hospital, in finding which factory that you should use, in getting information about customs problems in, in global shipping, those are things that most people in this room are not thinking about, and yet are sectors that are enormous and don't have great solutions yet. And so I've seen many more opportunities in businesses that are less sexy but still large. So, so sectors, finance, education feel less uh, kind of at the front end, less late in the stage of disruption, and yes. also B2B services. Yes. Okay, we're going to wrap it up there. Kevin Ryan.